Hi, every. What? Sorry. Oh. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, if you know Dan Goldberg, you know that I am not Dan Goldberg. Uh, he could not be here this morning, so I'm filling in as moderator. I'm Gage Kurt. I work with Dan at GW. Uh, we have an exciting panel this morning uh, featuring Brian Duncan from NASA Goddard, uh, Pawan Gupta from USRA, Pallavi Pond from the Health Effects Institute, and last but not least, Mindy De Paula from the Environmental Defense Fund. So we'll structure this set, uh, this panel like the previous panel and save uh, questions and discussion for the end. So Brian, if you want to um, come up. You could stand in the middle too, so you're on the camera. Thank you. Okay, my name is Brian Duncan, and I'm going to give you an update on my PI project. So, oh, there it goes. Okay. Okay. So, I have two co eyes here Kevin Cromar, he's at NYU, he's a health professor. And Anna Prados, she's at uh, UMBC and she also works with NASA. She has uh, decades of experience working with stakeholders and I'm very much dependent on both of those for this project. Uh, the title of my project is Integrating NASA Resources into the Standard Operating Procedures of the LMIC. <clears throat> our, our project methodology, we have two steps. The first is to engage um, a diverse set of stakeholders in the LMIC. Uh, uh, identify their common needs or individual needs. And then two is to identify ways to scale up this engagement. How can we reach more people than just, uh, just these few? How can we reach all of the stakeholders there? And our methodology is outlined in this paper if you're interested to find out more about it. Okay, so the idea is to take all of NASA resources, the NASA Air Quality Forecast System, which is led by Christoph Keller, uh, of course, satellite data, that's what NASA is all about, uh, a health air quality index that Kevin has developed, as well as if they want low cost sensors, we can work with low cost sensor folks to bring all those resources together uh, into the partner's decision making. So we have several partners, uh, Valeria Diaz at, at Quito, uh, Philippe Mandarino at Rio de Janeiro, and then we have uh, several people involved in the African Center for Clean Air, the ACCA. Okay, step one, working with stakeholders. Uh, so it's interesting working with these stakeholders. There's a wide range of expertise, financial resources at their disposable, uh, disposal, experience with uh, health and air quality issues, and their application needs. Uh, some of well, from a financial perspective, one of the groups that we're working with, they're relatively well-funded, but the vast majority are not. So keep that in mind. They just don't have a lot of money. Okay, so let me take a deeper dive into each one of these. So Rio de Janeiro, uh, they're a well-funded group and they're very interesting to work with, very dynamic. They have a lot of people uh, and they've been working with NASA for a while. They have a lot of experience. Uh, primarily on, for instance, landslide detection and prediction. Uh, they are aware of Christoph Keller's uh, air quality forecast, but interesting, they have little expertise using satellite data for air quality applications. And so we, we have a way in with them. Uh, and one th this is something that I found interesting because we're seeing this over and over and over. Their primary interests are identifying links between health outcomes and specific pollutants. And they're also uh, interested in engaging the benefits of pollution uh, reductions. So that's what they're getting from their higher ups. So Kevin Cromar has been working with this Rio group for the last year with month, uh, monthly telecons uh, to, do, to build capacity to do health analyses. Uh, so for the city government of Quito, this is very interesting because it's, it, they just don't have resources. It's essentially one person with a few people helping her. Uh, they have a little experience working with Christoph Keller on the NASA air quality forecast, uh, but they don't use satellite data at all uh, for their uh, projects. And again, they're interested in health outcomes, specific pollutants, just these health analyses. Their group is so small that uh, they, they just can't build capacity. This is something they can't do on their own. So Kevin and his team uh, have delivered 
a health analysis to them. So, you know, of course that's not sustainable. What do we do going forward in this situation where we have one government or one group that can build capacity and the other group, which represents the vast majority of people in the LMIC that can't. So I'd be interested to hear from health professionals of ways that you think that we could build this capacity on a grand scale. Oh, and then uh, as a next step for keto, uh, since they have this health analysis and Kevin's worked with them, uh, we're going to start integrating more satellite data into their applications. And we have in some ways, we, we presented several data sets to them for particular issues that they're having uh, and, that, and that's uh, going quite well, uh, but we can expand this and do more. The African Center for Clean Air. This is interesting uh, because we, we are really just starting with them. We've only been talking to them for about six months and have, we have mainly uh, worked with the two, uh, two of the leads uh, there and they are very enthusiastic, energetic, wonderful to work with. And basically they have ideas. They want, they want everything. They want satellite data to help them with everything. Uh, there's just so much uh, on their plates. This includes, for instance, uh, air quality monitoring, siting industry, they're interested in low-cost sensors, health impacts, uh, and they're also interested in messaging. How do you get message, how do you tell the public about poor air quality? So Anna has already uh, delivered one mini training. I helped her with that. Uh, this was a month or two ago, and we got feedback from the two leads. And now our next step is once we have that feedback, we're going to generate a, another training or a set of trainings uh, and expand out to all of the ACC members. Anybody who wants to attend can attend. Bolivia. So Anna has just initiated conversations with them. And what's interesting is they have a lot of capacity in the universities and that's the people she's talking to. They work with satellite data. Some of them, one of them has even worked at NASA for a while, but the government does not use satellite data for the most part, or, or pretty much at all. So we're working with them to figure out ways to, um, the best ways to integrate satellite data into the, these government type of initiatives. Okay, scaling up. Okay, so, you know, as I said, I've been working with stakeholders for several decades. So as Anna, you know, Kevin. So we know a lot of things that they need, uh, but now that we're working with the, so that was with high income countries. So now that we're working with the LMIC, we're learning new things. Uh, and of course the issue is, comes down a lot of times it's just financial resources. So we're uh, trying to develop methodologies to broaden the use of the natural resources among these countries. Uh, and ultimately we would like to make recommendations on how NASA uh, can further broaden data use in the LMIC with the emphasis on resource starved stakeholders. Okay, I think this is my last slide. So I just wanted to give a little uh, background and update on Kevin Cromar's Tiger team. So to this end, um, for the, our step two, uh, Kevin is uh, working with a number of HACAST members to create a, what we're calling a guidance directory or one-stop shop for air quality data sets. And we uh, are create, uh, putting into this, uh, this guidance directory, uh, validation information, assessment of uncertainties, all types of documentation, case studies, uh, and it has to be easy to access. And so fortunately, Jennifer Way of the guest disc is working with us on this. Uh, and uh, I encourage, it's taking a while to get all the data sets in there, getting everything we need. Uh, so uh, I encourage all of the people involved in this Tiger team, many people here uh, to work hard to get your data sets in so that we can get this uh, up and running. And I think that was all. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Can you, I didn't know that that had a pause. Can you pause it? That moment? Sorry. <laughs>
sorry my mistake <laughs> okay uh, hello everyone so i'm going to uh, provide some uh, updates on the our base projects and the tiger team projects and i want to acknowledge, acknowledge uh, all the collaborators and the team members uh, from multiple institutes uh, and our main uh, stakeholder in this project uh, uh, department of states for which we are doing their quality forecast at embassy location and then us epa where we are trying to ingest some of the satellite data and NOAA is a big partner in uh, with epa projects so if you could next slide please oh so i can go um, got it so uh, this is on a tiger team project uh, which we are just finishing up um, thanks to jenny we have a wonderful article which just came out if you want to learn about a lot more about details about this project what we are doing in this project is we are trying to fill some of the gaps in the ground monitoring using the satellite data in air now system and we are doing using the gozar satellite data in partnership with the noaa okay so what exactly we are doing here so we have these two satellites which are relatively new goes east and goes west and both of them uh, make measurements every 10 minutes for the entire uh, america and then every five minutes for the conus region so we are taking this measurements uh, noaa has developed a algorithm to calculate aerosol optical depth and that is uh, further converted to using a GWR methods to PM 2.5. So this is a NOAA's product, which is already there. In this Tiger team, uh, we took this product and then we bring in another data sets, which are metrology uh, from HRR model, and then run through a deep learning models to bias correct that data. Because when we did validation, we found some uh, specific bias, and I will give you some examples. And once we do that, uh, we, in this process, we also actually merge the two data sets because uh, the resolution of the goes east and goes west uh, differ depending on where you are in the US. So we are trying to get the best spatial resolution while merging the two uh, in the best way. And our final goal is to have a map like that at hourly and daily scale. So this whole data pipeline and framework is already developed and it's uh, operational on AWS platform, which will be eventually implemented for air now. Uh, and there are a number of publications which are there if you want to get details on this product. So just quickly on the machine learning part for the bias correction, uh, in order to do this more effectively, what we have done is we divided this into 14 different blocks. And for each blocks, we have a different machine learning models. Uh, and this is kind of a real, um, quick results. This is a Taylor diagram. And each letter here demonstrate uh, the block number here, which are listed here. And the blue colors are coming from the GOES GWR model, which is original NOAA product. And then this is our machine learning based, uh, deep learning neural network based model, which has uh, improving the bias. So if you see the red color, uh, letters below the blue color it means overall the correlations is improving and the standardization if it is shifting towards the left it means the standardization is improving uh, on top of what uh, NOAA has already producing okay so these are uh, some of the more specific results for each epa region uh, we have done use two years data and validated thoroughly uh, with states and epa regions and uh, this, these results, as you can see at hourly scales, looks pretty good. Uh, this number is called uh, index of uh, agreement, and that shows uh, it's always point larger than 0.9. That shows uh, excellent correlation. And we we have done this in a many different ways, cross uh, tenfold cross validation by station, by time, uh, by random sampling. So this is a very robust result in that sense. Okay, so just give you one example where the biases were in the existing data product. So if you look this PM 2.5, which comes from the GWR, uh, the y-axis is the bias and x-axis is the aerosol optical depth, which is a primary parameter which goes into calculating PM 2.5. You will see that uh, there are positive bias as the AOD goes very high. And these are specifically happens in the US when there are wildfires, smokes, and there are dust storms and things like that. When we run the DNN on top of GWR, we were able to actually correct most of that bias. Um, so that, that's one of the thing uh, improved uh, meant we have done in uh, existing product. So that uh, that project, that those were some technical results on that. Uh, we are almost uh, closing that projects now. 
uh, APA is in process to implement uh, some of these data sets in machine learning models, which we have produced. Uh, so that's where it is. Now, let me move on to a forecasting uh, project, which we are doing with uh, Department of States uh, over US embassies location. So in this uh, project, uh, what we are doing is uh, US embassies about 75 to 80 locations, they monitor PM 2.5 using a BAM monitor. And that data we used actually to integrate using machine learning with global model GIOS FP, which is uh, NASA's global forecasting model, which produce uh, forecast uh, every three hours. Uh, for aerosol and metrology, we combine that with the machine learning and do a bias corrected three hour forecast for the next uh, three days. So this, all, this framework is also on a cloud platform and uh, the, more recently, we have uh, initially we proposed to do 15 locations. Uh, now we are expanding to all the 75 locations which where they have. And then, uh, in addition, we also actually including the forecast on all 270 locations where US consulates are there all around the world. Uh, the system is currently live, but uh, we are still validating. So it's we haven't promoted it or made it public that much, uh, but it is live. And the system does provide. Uh, real-time validation capabilities of the forecast uh, wherever we have ground measurements available. Um, okay, so just to give you a, one example on that, uh, this is a forecast come from the GIOS FP if we do not do the, any bias correction using machine learning. Uh, this is example from the Delhi. And then on the bottom, if you do a bias correction using our uh, machine learning model, then you can see a significant improvement. Uh, this specific daily example is actually also being currently tested during this season. Uh, there is an agency in India, uh, IITM, Indian Institute of Tropical Metrology. They're running a uh, system to forecast air quality during this post monsoon season, specifically during a crop burning fire season, which affects the air quality across Indo-Gantetic plain. So they have been actually trying to compare several models in this forecast. Um, and they have their own models, but they're also inviting other people. So we have actually providing both GIOS FP and uh, GIOS uh, machine learning corrected model output in this uh, experiment. So this is one of the application which we're doing. Like I said, we have been expanding this to all the 270 locations. Uh, currently, uh, some of the uh, validations is undergoing uh, and uh, our focus for the next year will be more on developing uh, user guides and building capacity to the State Department and embassy staff to use this forecast. Uh, so we'll be do doing a lot of trainings online. And in person. So I think that's all I have. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Pallavi Pant. I'm from the Health Effects Institute, and I'm going to change tracks a little bit and talk not so much about the science that people are doing, but how we are using it as part of the work that we do at uh, our institute. And um, just to get everyone oriented, you may have heard from one of my colleagues at the previous HACAST meeting in June, a large part of the work that HEI does focuses on funding research on health effects of air pollution. That's what we've been doing for a very long time. But over the last several years, we've also started working around the world, especially in regions that have high levels of air pollution, thinking about ways that different data sets can be more accessible, usable. Um, and one of these efforts is what we call the state of global air. It's an annual uh, series of reports that we've been producing in collaboration with the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. We try and look at trends in air quality and health impacts over time. And um, there are many examples of how this data has been used in countries, um, in some cases to question uh, you know, what, what's being done within the countries, in other cases to try and figure out what individual cities and countries could do more. Um, and more recently, you know, just to highlight how um, sort of 
important the use of satellite data has been for our work. This is just a general overview of how health impacts are generated. And if you'll notice here, um, the first, very first step where we use the satellite data is to understand exposure levels uh, across the world, and then you know continue on combining it with data from epidemiology studies, et cetera. And what this has allowed us to do is produce maps like these, which give us a global understanding of where pollution levels are higher, um, you know, where we are perhaps starting to see improvements. Um, in some places, we are actually seeing air pollution levels get higher over time as well. Um, and a lot of what underlies this specific map is actually work that Randall and Aaron have been doing for a very long time, um, which has you know, allowed us to do this. And in more recent years, with um, in collaboration with Susan Annenberg, we have also started thinking about what we can look, um, you know, in individual cities. Can we try to understand what the air pollution trends are? Can we try to understand what the health impacts are? And building on the excellent work that Susan and a number of other people have done, uh, we recently released a report which looked at air quality levels and trends in cities around the world. The map here represents a subsection of these, uh, you know, those cities. We included about 7,000 in our report. I think there's about 13,000 in the analysis that Susan's team did overall. And the idea is if we start to go beyond the national level and at the city level where a lot of more recent interest and activity is, trying to think about air quality levels, trying to think about what we can do to address air pollution, um, can we begin to highlight regions of the world where we see larger problems. So if you look at this map, um, you know, we see hotspots in Western Africa. Some of the largest cities in, um, in Africa are in that region. We see hotspots in India and China, which is not very surprising. But there are also other cities that start to show up uh, more prominently once we go from national level estimates to city level estimates. And what data like this being available to us and then you know, um, producing reports or trying to highlight these trends and patterns allows us to do is uh, bring attention to where these problems are really pressing, where we need the most um, you know, sort of uh, active addressing of this issue. This is a snapshot of some of the news articles that were um, printed after the report came out from very different parts of the world. Not surprisingly, South Asia is where we get a lot of attention because A, people are very actively looking for new uh, ways and new sources of data sets, but also increasingly in parts of Africa and in parts of Central Asia where air pollution is a huge problem, um, but it doesn't rise up to the same levels perhaps as you know countries in Southern um, Asia or in Eastern Asia. And one of the things that I really wanted to highlight here for all of the HACAST PIs and again, I'm taking more of a outside the US perspective and looking globally at what some of the needs are. Um, I think the work that has already been done has been phenomenally useful for highlighting that yes, we have a problem, that it's a global problem, that there are regional hotspots which are really needing our attention. Um, but going on from there, there are still a lot of questions that people have about you know, how do I trust the satellite data in my country or in my city because I know there are no ground monitoring stations? So how do we communicate the relevance and usefulness of satellite data to people who will have, in some cases, very reasonable questions about, um, you know, how these data sets get built? So how do we reduce some of the uncertainties that we know about? And how do we continue to build confidence in using these data sets at different scales and different places around the world? And then also, are there other data products that you know we may not be familiar with, that we may not be using as much, that could be used in analysis um, like the one we do over time? And then again, looking at countries uh, in the global south, there are specific sources that are of particular importance because they play a huge role in the overall PM2.5 levels um, and also concentrations of other pollutants like curriculums, uh, waste burning. And there have been small efforts in individual countries to try and figure out how can we use satellite data to better understand this. But I think there's a lot of experts here who can hopefully help expand on those types of analysis and 
help build opportunities to utilize satellite data applications. And one example that I want to point out, which has been extremely useful and successful, and thanks to Pavan, who has been very prominent in promoting the use of this data, he mentioned that in India, during um, you know, this period exactly, October, November, we see a lot of crop fires, which are essentially stubble um, from agricultural fields that is being burned off in order to um, sort of sow the next round of crops. And what that results in is catastrophically high levels of PM2.5 across a region where millions and billions of people get exposed to it. And believe it or not, in the last five to seven years, the use of satellite data, images like this are everywhere in the news, in uh, the public conversations. There are WhatsApp groups that you know produce um, and use these files every day to say, here's how many crops are, or you know how many fires are burning today. So this has been a very helpful way of using satellite data, not just for policy decisions, but also for trying to raise awareness and to get people to use this data. And it's happened because this is very easy to use. This is very easy to understand. Anyone is able to go on the website, look at this and make sense of it, you know, more dots, more fires. Um, so how can we continue to make progress on the work that's already happening so that this becomes possible for a lot more satellite products over time, especially in low and middle income countries. And before I close, I just want to highlight that in the other part of the organization where we focus more on research funding, earlier this year, we did a work, uh, workshop, which was virtual. Several people here were in the, in the workshop as well. And we're now looking at ways that our organization can help support research um, on health effects connecting satellite data with health, which has come up a few times in the last one and a half days. So please contact my colleague Allison or myself um, if you have ideas or thoughts for us to think about. And with that, I'll close and look forward to the discussion. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Mindy DePaola. I'm a program manager in the Office of the Chief Scientist at Environmental Defense Fund. Um, I think perhaps this presentation will be a combination of the two sessions in this room today, um, as I focus mostly historically on the environmental FP side and now more on the in community engagement aspect of these projects. So um, I'll start out with two US air quality projects. Um, nationwide that EDF is working on and then go into um, two, two projects in New York City specifically. Um, you might have heard about Air Tracker if you were at HACAS in January. Um, I presented about it then and it was not yet launched. Um, collaborating with Dr. John Lynn at University of Utah and Create Lab at Carnegie Mellon. Um, if you didn't, Air Tracker is um, a tool that we love to talk about um, that uses meteorological models to make visual connections between the air you're breathing and the locations of air pollution sources in a city. So essentially users can view source areas which show where the air is potentially coming from, likely coming from in real time and also um, up to a year right now. Um, namely, we're using a stilt model driven by her from NOAA this is a great time to mention that I'm not an expert in modeling. Um, so if you do have questions on the modeling, I'm happy to punt them to somebody else. Um, here's the URL, welcome you to check it out. Um, give us some feedback, it is live now. Um, we, are, we started in Houston um, with some of our community group engagements there. And then also our partners are in Pittsburgh and Salt Lake City. So we do have air tracker in those cities. Um, so yeah, check it out online. And um, back in January, I, when I presented, I said some of the next steps were um, completing focus groups with our community EJ groups in Houston and then incorporating the feedback. Um, that was a super iterative process. It was from February until end of May, really, that we um, went back and forth with community groups and got their feedback on that. Um, some of their feedback was the language that we were using was too technical. Um, also, we were using the back 
this is the too technical term is the back trajectory um, was looking like a plume of smoke, which is not really helpful when you're trying to show um, where the air is coming from uh, if you're not, if the smoke isn't representing the air. So just tweaking in some of the icons, tweaking some of the language, and we finally did launch in May in those three cities. Um, just recently, last month, we launched also in Birmingham, Alabama and Vallejo, California, based on some places where we have community engagement as well. Um, now we are sorting through some maybe potential case studies for new cities to be added, and we're also dialing in the current version. Um, moving on to another nationwide project that's in its really early stages um, with the University of Vermont Transportation Research Center, um, Greg Rowengold and his student Brittany um, are working on near road exposure and traffic density project. Um, so essentially it's a multi-skill evaluation of pollution exposure to air pollutant emissions from light, medium and heavy duty tra vehicle traffic. Um, they're evaluating exposure levels at the state, county and neighborhood scale, and this is nationwide. Um, originally, one of the objectives was for this tool or map or whatever um, resource to be able to support adv advocacy of communities and community groups that experience disproportionate health impacts, um, but I will will revisit that objective. Um, again, uh, the volume data was obtained from the Federal Highway Administration. Um, they're using EPA's moves. Uh, modeling to estimate the vehicle traffic emissions for every roadway for each vehicle type, uh, light, medium, and heavy duty. And then the emissions are aggregated by census block and combined with the census population data to evaluate the exposure levels um, and locate disproportionate exposure across the US. Um, so this is where that last point of, of maybe helping advocacy efforts comes in. Um, the, the first thought uh, we had when this project was starting was that we were, like I think someone else mentioned, we were going to create a really cool tool and we we're going to roll it out. And it's going to have maps and it's going to be interactive and everyone was going to use it. Um, and in our initial talks with community groups, they didn't really care about it, <laughs> to be honest. And so the people that did care were other folks at EDF, policymakers, legal folks other academic researchers that we're collaborating with. Um, and so, so we may revisit that objective at a later date, but right now we're looking at how to make that data accessible for maybe other stakeholders. And we will be collaborating with Dan Tong's group, um, Susan Annenberg again, and other folks here. Um, so now moving into specific community engagement projects in New York City. One of these, I'll start with a project that we're more in the early stages on and move on to one that um, you've heard a lot about, especially from Gage and Susan earlier. So maybe it'll be a good wrap up. Um, the background on this Chinatown project, we're focused on Manhattan's Chinatown um, because we had seen from a lot of the models and the science um, from, from some other parts of EDF and also collaborators here that Manhattan's Chinatown has the worst or one of the worst air quality of any Manhattan neighborhood um, on par with the Bronx, et cetera. Um, but unlike the Bronx um, and other parts of, of New York, there's really a lack of advocates' voices and there's a lack of um, EJ groups that are activating on this issue. And so, you know, before we get into if the satellite data is gonna be helpful and what tools are useful and what maps are useful, we wanted to understand, we needed to understand what's preventing the advocacy to begin with and what's preventing the action. So our team is um, in the office of the chief scientist, air quality and public health professionals, as well as um, our lead social scientists in psychology. And then we're collaborating with the Cornell Atkinson Center um, with professors focused on cross-cultural communication studies and ethnographic information studies. Um, and then of course, we are partnering with a group in Chinatown um, made up of, of folks that have lived and worked there. Um, so we, we started this project earlier this year. And uh, this is, if you were in the room yesterday for community engagement, this is where um, one of my questions came from. We started, gathering data through interviews and conversations, um, and nobody wanted to talk really about air quality. Um, so I think this is, this is a challenge that has come up in our work. Um, they, most of the population of Manhattan's Chinatown is, is elderly, and English is not their first language. So when some young folks who do speak their language come to their neighborhood and chat with them about things that are going on, they take the opportunity to talk about everything else because they're super lonely. 
and that's the reality of folks there. So um, it, it changed a little bit of our timeline, and I think it's a reminder to all of us to, that we have to be really flexible when, when we're working with these groups. And, and air quality has come up since then, um, but, but it's taken more time than, than maybe we initially expected. Um, beyond that, next year, we're hoping to um, translate the knowledge we've gained um, and exchange with them into some action. Um, it's a, again, an iterative and participatory process between the community and folks at EDF and Cornell, um, and hopefully move into some com informational campaigns. And then beyond that, we hope to stay engaged with them. Um, they're good friends now, and, and I see them probably three or four times a year, so. Um, and then finally, we'll move to the project in the South Bronx, um, building upon Susan and Gage's work, they did all the hard work and then we took it from there. Uh, and so this is, you might have seen this map, uh, maybe in a different format in Gage's presentation, but we just it up a little bit and made it easier, I think, for the community to really um, get behind. And so one of the things that Susan had mentioned in the last session was this back and forth between community groups when Susan and, and Gage were looking at different models and and the differences between the two models. We were talking to the community groups and saying, hey, like which one of these looks um, more accurate to you? What do you think? How is it going on the ground for you? Does this make sense? Are we totally off base? And then from that, we created um, this pretty little map and we continued engaging with them beyond the map and beyond the research with, with GW. Um, so again, this is one of our groups that we meet with very regularly. We've had an ongoing relationship with them. We've known their priorities since before we started showing them the maps um, and, and realized that air quality was super important to them and pediatric asthma. And so um, the maps was just a, a great fit um, and aligned really well. And also someone else today brought up storytelling and how that's what communities are really interested in. And so um, one of the exciting new parts that Susan and Gage haven't seen yet either is that we created um, what's called a, a scrolly telling map. So if you see the really pretty maps on like New York Times or ProPublica, um, we've created one with, with the data from Susan and Gage um, that lives on the South Bronx website. So they own this um, page with all this information about air, air quality and air pollution in their neighborhood. Um, to kind of live in perpetuity there. And um, it's not live yet because the group has it, you know, so I can't share it with you today, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to share that soon. So with that, um, that's the end. Thank, I think I'm the very last of the very last session of the whole week. So thank you for bearing with me. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll take questions. Yeah. The other panelists can come back, back down, please. Who wants to start us off with a question or two? Chris. So I have a question for Mindy, I guess. Um, so I, I know you're working with some physical scientists and some social scientists. Can you talk a little bit about how that works and, and kind of what each of those groups kind of contributes to a study and like how do they interact and like yeah. talk to each other? Sure, yeah. Have you heard of herding cats before? Uh -huh. <laughs> no. um, I think, it's been pretty easy, actually. It's been it's been really nice, um, and maybe that's because Susan and Gage paid me to say that. But it's they're super. Um, I think when when I'm sorry, yeah. Are we like it was working? It was yeah, I was making. Yeah, I think it was just a bit. better just to pass this back and forth. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, I think the most important part about that was is uh, the kickoff meeting, actually, which I think is a very uh, maybe overlooked meeting, and and the details of this of the science are often you know talked about at length, which are also important. Um, but defining those roles and uh, at the very beginning, and then I think um, a plug for EDF is that it's we're particularly well placed to kind of be the center of that and, and, and have folks speak to each other in that way and, and really uh, 
wrangle everyone on in one direction. Um, also at the very beginning of that kickoff meeting, defining the priorities of the community group. I think when you involve the human aspect of it, uh, even scientists can care about, <laughs> about what's happening. So I think that's a really important aspect too. Other questions? And if you could introduce yourself too, I forgot to mention that. Okay, so this is a question I feel like throughout all the panels keeps coming into my mind and I'm sure others too. Um, and it's kind of the science communication aspect. Um, and it became particularly salient when Pallavi, you pulled up the satellite images that are actually being used to disseminate information to everyday people. Um, and then Mindy, you mentioned too, like in this, like New York's Chinatown, there isn't the same level of advocacy. Um, and I just start thinking about like, where do my like relatives who like English is a second language for them, like where are they getting their information from and what makes um, some of these concerns like salient for them? So broad question for anyone to answer is what role do we as scientists, public health professionals, et cetera, play in elevating our data and our maps and like promoting that into the media or places where people get their information um, and trust their information. A lot of times it's the news or um, my family members are in these WhatsApp groups, but you know, whatever it is, um, how do we like, do we have a role in that? And if so, what what is the need, I guess? Oh, and my name is Mitra. start. <laughs> I think that's a really good question and also, you know, something that I think about a lot because a lot of people uh, in my family, they don't really speak in English. So a lot of the work I do like doesn't mean anything to them unless it's translated to a different language. And the way I see it, there's always going to be a role for science communication, but within the scientific community, some of us tend to be more comfortable playing that role and others maybe not so much. So to the extent that we can find ways to connect with people who can play that role really well and thinking of ways, um, if there are target communities, what are the other languages that we should be putting out our data on? Um, and, you know, a, a common thing that at least I've experienced in engaging with journalists in some cases is as scientists, we tend to be very particular about the, the data, the uncertainties that come with the data and qualifiers that we want to bring in because that's what science is. But trying to shift that a little bit to think of like if a journalist is trying to write a short story and they're looking for you know a two sentence statement from you, what is that statement that is, you know, can be derived from your work? Um, I think that's one really important thing for us to think about. And then the other piece is there are really good trained science communicators. And there's a lot that as scientists, we can learn from them. Um, so I would encourage anyone who is interested in a more public facing and engaging, um, you know, type of science uh, or like research pathway to find those people and to engage with them early so that you can find the common touch points. Yeah, I think um, Lavi said exactly what I would say. I'll just add, uh, well, because I was gonna say hire science communicators. Actually, Madison, Wisconsin has a really good um, science communication program. I'm pretty sure they have uh, graduate programs in that. So fund and hire science communicators. Um, and the part that I was gonna add with, with a little sound bite um, is, for community groups or policymakers or legal folks, um, the they're there, like boil it down to a statement that can be made. Because what we often do within the Office of the Chief Scientist when we're talking, even internally, is um, look at all this data, it's so great. This map shows all of these things. And then they're like, cool, yeah. It, what, well, what's a sentence we can say from this? What, like, if, if all this is true, what can we say with all of the data that you're showing me? Because the there there is what what they want to take with them. And so I think that's true with with media. I think that's true with community groups. I think it's true with policy. Um, and so I think knowing that from your own project, because sometimes it catches you off guard when someone asks that and you're like, oh yeah, what did I just learn about all of this? And so knowing that going into the conversation is extremely helpful.
I don't have. Okay. Oh, okay. Let me add one thing. <laughs> uh, I think only one thing I want to add as a scientist, uh, we always shy away from talking to media, to the public, and, and in public forums where we feel that, okay, things can be misinterpreted or they might not understand. Mm -hmm. So I would just say that don't shy away and try to talk. Maybe you cannot do the best, but I think uh, we should not be too cautious about misinterpretation. Things will happen. Uh, people post on social media, and sometimes people take it otherwise or in different ways. Those things will happen. You cannot control that. But that should not uh, limit ourselves to make our uh, voice heard. Other questions? Hi, thank you for such a great, great panel. Um, so on the science communication topic, you know, I think one thing that I heard from all of your panels was also how important it is to listen to the community. And I think, you know, some science communication training is focused on that two-way thing. Some of it is just like, here's how to get your message out. And I mean, both are valuable, but I think it's worth distinguishing the two. There's one book uh, that came out about two years ago called The Engaged Scholar by Andy Hoffman, who's a professor in business at uh, the University of Michigan. And it's super short and very salient, I think, to these topics. Um, but a question I had is, you know, I think one challenge, and this came up about the incentives, I think, in the last panel, um, was, is this idea of who funds this kind of work? Because research is so expensive relative to almost any other type of community engagement, outreach, nonprofit activity. And I think we're really fortunate to have NASA funding ACAST and funding this effort and, and requiring engagement with different stakeholders. Um, but I think that you know one theme has been that Na satellite data, NASA products cannot do everything. And so there's a need for a, maybe a more expansive approach to stakeholder engagement and listening to communities. But where are the resources there? Because it's so non-standard for scientific activities, and yet science is so expensive. This, I think this party, I think it's on. So in my project, one of the issues is clearly that we're dealing with um, a whole group of people with limited resources. That's the underlying problem. They just don't have a lot of money. Uh, they have the will, uh, they're energetic, they're enthusiastic, they just don't have the money. So that's our biggest issue. Uh, another issue that we're having uh, for my project because of the LMIC is we're dealing with um, people from all different cultures. And there's no way that we can actually, um, I mean, I can't possibly know how to communicate to all of these different people. So I have to, so in our project, our, our approach has always been to um, work closely with people who are in, in country, you know, who live there, who, who grew up there, who know the cultures and uh, just work with them that way and see what they think is the best way to do communication. So going back to your comment about cost, you know, research is expensive. Uh, we're just we're taking the approach of um, of training the trainers. In other words, we're helping we're working with them to bring them up to speed and say, look, there's all these great NASA resources. You can use them for, for you know for basically for nothing. Uh, you just need a laptop to do this. Um, but as far as the communication goes, that's your thing. You know, as far as the research, I guess they would have to uh, if they wanted to do, for instance, their own health analysis. They would have to find the funds within their own country to do that, or or externally. One. Oh, okay. I'm good. Um, so I think Brian and and Tracy sort of alluded this issue, and uh, I do want to sort of bring out this new concept actually coming from NASA headquarters. Uh, next year will be the year of open science, right? So, and this is sort of bring the research community into sort of into a same community that we need to share of our knowledge and expertise, and we're interfacing with our user community all differently, but we are limited with the resources. 
So, and as Brian said, there is, you know, uh, kind of training program from headquarter is called TOPS, is, is sort of helping the community sort of going to this open science way. What does that mean for the data that are coming from the NASA, you know, satellite, or how can we bring down the message share uh, with the variety of the user needs? The, the user could be the students that hear the the, the user could be the community coming from decision makers. How can we work together in the community, given that we already know what we know and share the resources that way? So I, I do want to sort of bring out that way. And, 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 and saying that from the data system perspective, that um, NASA is also putting out the data into this cloud per se, whatever this cloud is open source, NASA still doing this a open access, right? But, you know, it's not dumping the data in the, in the cloud and say, hey, go ahead and use it. Now is, uh, we, I've heard so many people talking about what is the way we can guide the community using the data within their own needs. And then I think you guys sort of uh, raise a lot of concern. That's where we are hoping to get your guidance and we're engaging uh, all kind of community. And uh, I do wanna point it out, um, Elizabeth Joyner actually putting um, her talk and, and so that's, she sort of alluded out, there are multiple user needs and then there is a documentation there using NASA uh, resources, you know, if you're the new, you want to just get a quick uh, look and feel, um, you know, using worldview, for example. And if you are a power user, you don't, you know what exactly you want. There's an API there. So there is a documentation already right there. And I think, you know, it's just more transparent communication. And if you're not aware of it, um, so just, I, I would like to point that out. I was just gonna say, if you wanna find Elizabeth Joyner's virtual flash talk, you can find it on the KCAST media website. <laughs> Tracy, I'll just add to that resources, although best received in the form of money is, um, can also be other things and especially for community groups. So something that we're seeing a lot is um, there's, there are grant opportunities out there and folks don't know how to apply for them. And, and so I think, uh, you know, if, if you don't have, if you're not able, we have some flexibility at EDF and I know we're in a particularly placed position to do that, but if, if you can't like put in a line item for, you know, a stipend for a community group or something like that, perhaps it's offering grant support or, or some other technical support in that way. Yes. Any other responses before we ask another question? No. Um, actually, if, sorry, I'm, I'm just gonna add another layer to what you said, Tracy. I think one challenge is also, um, you know, going a little bit away from funding directly, but in working with, whether it is community groups here in the US or it is working with groups outside the US who maybe, you know, as um, Ryan, you were saying, like they have less resources, they may not have as much, um, you know, money or, uh, things to support their work is also keeping in mind that we shouldn't just be like data dumping into those groups um, mm -hmm. and recognizing that they come with their own experiences and their own understanding of what the problems are and where the solutions lie and respecting that. Um, and just adding to what uh, Mindy said, keeping in mind that there are like creative funding opportunities that can be uh, made, I think, I will just, you know, raise two examples. I think Susan and Chris are both working with support from groups like US EPA, which fund very traditional research, but then also working with groups like C40 Cities, which are very policy and applications oriented. So identifying perhaps more of those opportunities as a community so that we can connect science to, uh, you know, the research questions that need to be answered, but also policy uh, and advocacy questions, if we wonder. Go for it. 
so I'm, I'm here from the ITR in North America. Uh, I just have a question to the positive front of me today. It's going to be great to our future. I guess it's a really good discussion to add that. Uh, so, coming from a platform that like uh, kind of back into college, there are also like CV based processes, CV based monitoring spaces. We are like having monitoring spaces in the CV that have like 70,000 followers, meaning that people go after like the fun and follow that station, seeing how the algorithm changes. And interestingly enough, we get inquiries saying, and uh, we see that, for example, we see higher compensation in this space, but we don't see higher compensation in another, another space in the same city. So, what I'm trying to say is that we think that building capacity by giving users power to get back to us, and we are partners uh, in terms of valuable uh, relationships. Uh, we, we get queries like, uh, I have co location. The word co location came from a user. Uh, that followed the station. We co located this uh, with another friend of mine and this distant dog, and we, they kind of co taught FAQ. So I guess we can kind of putting it out there. Um, you're uh, as a scientist, uh, maybe I'll put off my scientist hat for a moment. As a, as a scientist, sometimes we try to make things elaborated, sophisticated, and fancy so that the data product can serve different purposes. But when user oriented projects come, come along, you just need to make sure that it's uh, concise, you're sending it one sentence after. And uh, that's when they're almost useful because um, what the report that Paul mentioned, instead of both ways, we provide something similar to that of the whole day product report. Um, it's a very comprehensive, extensive report that's like useful for different stakeholders. But we provide a one page thing, and that one page actually hits the likes and follows a lot more. For them. That says something that says that if you want to communicate with your users, better wherever they are, they're in they're Africa, it's hard for them to actually communicate with you back, or wherever in the world. It's, it's very concise and very, very clear. Um, I guess that's where you get the more uh, effect. Yeah, I think um, you know, I'll just I, I'll just back you on that idea that for a lot of users, large reports, large data sets are not as helpful as perhaps one infographic, one fact sheet. We've seen the same thing with you know our reports. We have a report which is not big at all, uh, generally like 30 pages or so, but we still get a lot more people using our two-page country profiles with the same exact information. Um and the other piece that you said, and I think someone else said earlier before as well, which is trying to look for ways in which people that are using the data and using the information feedback to you on what makes sense and doesn't make sense to them uh, can be very valuable because sometimes with science, we don't have the right data and the right information to understand, you know, why am I seeing this particular pattern in this neighborhood and not somewhere else? And people who are more actively engaged in those communities or in those neighborhoods can tell you exactly what's going on. Um, so I think that feedback loop can be really powerful. I think I'll just add to the feedback side of things um, that it, if 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 the user is specifically a community group, although I deal with any group, um, it's it would be great if if you got that feedback um, before you had a finalized product. And so going going to the community group with a even a semi final product it. it is not as I think productive as if you're in the early stages and have a lot more wiggle room, um, and and also uh, knowing what you can and cannot make changes to when you ask for that feedback, it is really helpful to be transparent um, when when you're presenting that. And I, I can make one more point on that. So I'm not talking to you know people on the street. I'm talking to uh, educated people in the LMIC. These are air quality and health professionals. Uh, and me being me, I put together my my spiel, my big presentation, uh, you know, my 45 slides, and I talked to them for an hour and I asked for their feedback about the presentation and, and what they thought. And I hope they were saying, oh, we love satellite data. We can see potential for this. And they just said, 
wow, that was that was an information dump. That was too much information. What were you thinking? <laughs> you know, you lost all the directors that, you know, they were sitting in a room. I couldn't see them because I was on, you know, this call. And they said, oh, they started looking at their iPhones. And, they, and I was like, okay, well, I really screwed that up. What do I do now? How do I fix this situation? Uh, and they said, S send us a few case studies, just a few case studies. And we'll go over it with our, our, uh, our upper management to get buy-in from them. And that's how we had to do it. So, you know, you can be conscientious and diligent like me and actually just turn a lot of people off and they don't listen. So you're right. Give them little sound bites, you know, get them, get them interested with a few little case studies. And uh, we're finding that that's the best way to do it. Um, am I good? Um, so, so I think, you know, um, this is really thanks to the Kevin Cromer's Tiger team. This is the very first time that, you know, uh, the products coming from this team are coming to the NASA uh, DAG per se. So uh, whatever the DAG, you know, right now we actually have, we know all our users, their user behavior, what exactly they need, but this is the, the very first time the data is sort of thanks to the Tiger team and coming to the DAG that we can learn even more. Now, sort of back to this gentleman's point is, you know, now going to the cloud, right? And, and what NASA is trying to do is really exactly what your point is empowering user and guide the user what they would like to see. Now the data in the cloud open, you know, there's NASA data, EPA data, NOAA data, but a lot of users may not know what exactly they need to use for their purpose. Um, that's, you know, I didn't really want to talk about this earlier is um, we are thinking about a science enabling center for air quality or in a uh, health way. So this is sort of one of the way we can sort of empower use, user community. And there's a lot of backend technology we are hashing out that way. Could you um, give us a, a soundbite for what the DAC is in case folks aren't familiar? <laughs> The, um, the DAC? Yeah. Okay. NASA has 12 data centers. So um, in terms of the data center, you know, is a trustworthy and, and core certified repository. Now, um, so within Gather, we already have four different data centers. So uh, the data center, we have to follow, you know, the open site or the standard uh, for the data format and metadata, right? Uh, and we distribute it you know, openly to the world. It's whether, you know, you, as long as you register with us so we know who you are. And when the science team actually updated, you know, have a new version coming out, we can disseminate that way to the user side. Now that's just the data archive, but on the other hand, the data center sort of working together to provide the tool for, you know, and looking at different uh, user type. So, um, and hopefully increase the data access uh, capability. And now uh, going further, we actually trying to uh, mine through all the publication and learning the user, how they use the NASA data in a different, application and, and hoping that, you know, the information will feed back to the user when they discover and Google the information. Thank you. Other questions? Hi, I'm Caitlin Kobeck. I work for the Wisconsin DNR. And I'm kind of curious as to, and this is a general question for everyone, uh, how do you see the role of municipal uh, agencies in urban planning, transportation, zoning, when you're working with these community groups and getting the information out. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the question is what the role of municipalities and agency, local agencies are in, in community engagement and air quality. Yep, and just like, 
some of the mechanisms they have to kind of you know, help resolve some of these actual issues. Sure. Through zoning yeah. and urban planning. Um, I I think uh, the reality is for most of the groups that I've personally worked with is that they don't know where to start or if they can contact any local group or agency or municipality. Um, one thing that we did do in that South Bronx project was um, folks, we worked with municipalities, uh, the local, a local municipality group, and we had them come hold um, like a panel of sorts, a discussion, a workshop, in the Bronx, in like a garden in the Bronx. And so I think, cause sometimes there are times when the community group is, uh, knows that, that, you know, some agency exists and it's um, like, you have to take a train to the city or it's whatever it is, it's not so accessible. And so I think like explaining what you can do or how they can access any programs that you might have um, or give feedback to you in, in their community, in like a garden, something that's like very low key um, and informal in their space is helpful in terms of like the scientific project piece. Um, I, I actually do think that the way we've been connected is through um, our academic partners. Um, so I think that that relationship has been really good um, for us in that way, uh, but that's just, yeah, one, one experience. Um, so I don't know if anyone else has a really specific kind of question, but yeah, not I think one one example that I can just give um, as as a community member in Massachusetts, like one of the things that the city of Boston has been doing, um, and I'm you know not not as um, sort of well versed with their full plans, but the city of Boston has been trying to find avenues for neighborhood engagement. Um, and through these neighborhood engagements, they often bring together issues that relate to climate and air pollution, uh, but at the same time thinking about, you know, walkability or parking. So it's not necessarily focused um, messaging just on air pollution or just on climate. It may be around transportation related issues or, you know, what are we going to do with this parcel of land which is up for like development and then bringing in air quality, bringing in climate, bringing in health um, to ensure that there's like an integrated approach. Um, but this is really from the side of like seeing how that process is unraveling and not really knowing what they're in, in you know. In uh, Pawan, Brian, pass, okay. I think we have time for maybe <laughs> one more question or a couple of short ones does anyone yeah following up on that you know i think one of the real challenges as scientists coming into this space is that we don't know who all the players are and it can be hard enough to meet one person much less build the 10 relationships with organizations at different scales and with different missions i mean even just here in madison like there's a lot of organizations that I don't know, you know, who are pl playing a role in this. Um, and I guess, you know, an extra layer is that if you're trying to do something new, like using satellite data in a new way, you know, everybody's very, very busy. So if you even get like one organization who might be interested, like that can be a starting point, but it's not an ending point. And so I think like one of the, you know, I think sort of like structural challenges is to figure out like what mechanisms work. And I think when, when, thing that, you know, maybe just as we're ending this Haycast meeting, I think one of the things that's been great has been that NASA has from the beginning said that there should be twice an an, twice a year meetings of this team. And so it means that, like if somebody goes in the spring and likes it, they can recommend to somebody else in their office to go in the fall. And it can kind of build a momentum because sometimes if you just have one meeting or one meeting a year, then there's no opportunity for those kind of connections to take place. So this isn't, you know, uh, you know, I think that actually like the, this is such an exciting panel because you're all working with different organizations and yet as much as you're doing, which is like at the forefront, there are so many organizations that aren't yet at the table. Yeah, I'll just sort of follow up in the same thing. Uh, so the the four different groups that, that we've been working with, we didn't start out with them. 
we, we tried to talk to a number of different cities and a number of different groups around the world. Uh, and we keep running into issues that they're too busy. They just don't have time. They're like, oh yeah, that sounds great, but you know, I've got these deadlines. You know, can you help me do that? And I was like, no, we can't help you do that, but we can't help you do this. Well, sorry, goodbye. You know, that's just the problem that we're having. Uh, so I don't know what the solution to that is, uh, other than the only way that we found uh, is to find what I, I refer to as the champion, the person in that country or that city who has the energy and the ability to uh, interact with, let's say, the city government or the region, whether that person's in academia or actually in the, in the city government itself. Uh, so we're depending on that champion, and that's hard to find that champion. It, it's not a simple thing to do just because people are busy or resource limited, whatever. Um, if I can add to this, and it may have come up in the session yesterday on community engagement, I think one of the other challenges that comes up from time to time is if there are multiple research groups or um, you know partnerships trying to find community members to engage with or community groups to engage with. Uh, at one point, there is going to be research fatigue because I don't want to be asked the same questions over and over again over five years by different people. Um, and you know that may very well be the case with policymakers as well, because in a lot of uh, low and middle income countries, you know, where there is a lot of attention and funding, you can find people from everywhere trying to get the same conversations going. So it's it's incredibly challenging. And I think this layer, you know, can further add to that. So just trying to be um creative and mindful in who and where we are engaging and taking their time because they are contributing their expertise and efforts to make sure we can do what's like worth for them. Um, so yeah, I don't know what the solutions are, but lots for us to think about. We have a couple minutes, two minutes. Uh, is there a two minute question out there? Otherwise we can, Tracy or Jenny, if you wanna give any closing remarks. No, I don't mean to put you oh, on the spot. No, that's all right. I'm okay being on the spot. But uh, really, I just want to say thank you to everyone here um, for participating in this meeting. Great panel uh, to end on. Excellent moderators. Great AV. And you know, um, and really, I think it's it's the the folks in the room that are making this such an exciting meeting to meet people and have conversations that you might not have had before. And we're hoping to see many of you at our next meeting. We'll send it along, of course, to our email list. Everyone here is going to be added to our email list, whether you want to or not. And uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, and for the, and just in terms of our next steps, we are moving forward with the next round of Tiger Teams, as John mentioned yesterday. So if you have ideas for things that have come and say from this meeting, say, gosh, that would be helpful. Please don't hesitate to send them to me or to Jenny, and we will put them in the pot and share them with all of our uh, investigators um, and hopefully, you know, move forward with partnered research and even the things that don't get selected as tiger teams, I think often become the seeds of other initiatives and collaborations. So um, I think that you, that it's a it's a fruitful process on on different levels. Thank you to everybody for coming and look forward to staying in touch. Thank you.